the one, for years we, we had the running joke here that of course our Metropolis Finance Committee was chaired by Steve and Steve, and if we ever wanted to bring the national finance people in, it would be George and George and Steve and Steve. George, uh, George Matthews and George Vervulius chair the stewardship and finance committees respectively of our archdiocese. They have great experience in traveling to the various metropolises and parishes to help them, and they come here as an offering of their love and commitment to Christ. And so, please welcome Mr. George Matthews and George Vervulius. Good morning. Everybody get their slippers on. Sit back and relax because you're uh, in line for one of our usual five and a half hours presentations of us telling you what to do, which you won't do anyway. It is really a pleasure for both of us to be back uh, at the Pittsburgh Metropolis. I was visiting with a few of your priests last night. We told some stories and uh, Father Levan Us said to me, oh, you have to tell that one in the morning. I'm not telling that one in the morning. But uh, we have my friend George from Australia, who's down under, who gives a lot of time and effort to his, his church. He's on the uh, P and B P plan today. Uh, he's preparing for all of this with his pills, as you know, last night, or yesterday afternoon when we got here, George went to visit one of your nice hospitals here. And after listening to him last night, I'm not too sure that he really had to stay as long as he did, but there was a very attractive blonde nurse there, and he was interested in having conversation. And as my friend George normally does, he tries to make the best out of everything. I have to tell you, last night though, I had to tie his leg to the bed. He was flying in the room. I don't know what they gave him at that hotel, but if anything ever happens to me, that's where I want to go because he was smiling last night. He really was in a lot of pain. I draw the line in doing certain things, but I had to help my friend with his boots, his shirt, several other things. It was an honor to do that, but uh, very hard. You know, we, we, used to, we used to sit here and we used to tell you, oh, this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to prepare, and he wants us to give back to him exactly what he's given to, to us which is a return of the gifts, no doubt about it. However, the methodology, the methodology of, of what we have done in the past is all out the window. No more five and a half hour presentations, involvement, exchange, interchange, challenge, strategic planning, parishes are like anything else. You have to know where you're going in the future. George says, how many of you go to the airport and buy a ticket to somewhere? Not many. You know where you have to go, and that's why you buy the ticket. So we're here to tell you about the new methods and the new concerns about stewardship. Several years ago in Ireland, there was a monastery, and the nuns from the Catholic Church would take care of this monastery. They're all dying, these little roadside venues and monasteries. It was a rainy night, lightning and thunder, and the Mother Superior was laying in the bed, and she was dying. She's ready for herself to meet the master. And some poor novice didn't know what to do. She was moved with the spirituality of the moment. And she went to the kitchen and she heated up a glass of milk from Mother Superior. She wanted to ease her passage to the Lord. She tenderly lifted up the nun's head, put the glass of warm milk to her lips. And the old Mother Superior tasted it two or three times and she pushed her hand away. Poor novice was just heart much. And an older nun took her to the kitchen. She poured out half of the milk. She reached up on the top of the shelf, and there was an old dusty bottle, bottle of 35-year-old uh, Tullamore Dew Irish whiskey. And she equaled the measure that she threw out with Irish whiskey and mixed it up. She says, you give it to the superior. So the novice trembling went back and lifted up her head. And she put the glass in front of her. And the nun went, And she lit a little bit and finally she grabbed the glass and she sat up in bed and she downed the whole thing, laid back on the pillow and she says, ah. 
and ready to meet the Lord. And with that, the other nuns were all prayerfully happy that she came back to life. And she said, Mother Superior, give us some words of wisdom. Give us words of wisdom before you go to meet God. She leaned up with an Irish twinkle in her eye on one arm and she says, don't sell the cow. I didn't think it would take this over the morning. So, stewardship, change in paradigm. You have been blessed with people who understand what we're doing. You have a tremendous stewardship committee. You have tremendous people that, that work on behalf of you as individuals, the metropolis, and the archdiocese, because it's our archdiocese. It's not mine, it's not his, it's, not, it's ours. And the unification of thought is very important in this process. And George will tell you later on that when you mention the word stewardship, everybody thinks what? Money, you're right. Not the case. Not the case anymore. And there's great reward in the new approach to stewardship. I enjoy traveling with George. I learn every time we're together. I learned a lot of things this weekend about tolerance for someone that's sick. I guess my stewardship to him was helping him through this in the morning. And Steve Sellis and uh, a couple of the priests and the president of the parish council here took over and carried on their stewardship by taking George to uh, uh, some kind of a, a treatment uh, or a hospital here that, that really took care of him. But when he called me to pick him up and come home, he couldn't speak, so I apologize for us not being able to present yesterday. I'm going to let George come up here. I'm going to ask your forgiveness if he gets a little tongue tied. He's already popped a couple of Vicodins this morning, and, and I'm worried about him. But uh, he's humorous, he's a good man, and I thank God that the two of us have become friends. So without further ado, I'm going to let George get into the stewardship presentation, and we're running behind a little bit, uh, but we'll make it up. We, we try to get, stay on schedule. This is an interactive participation, and we hope that you'll not be afraid to tell us what you feel, because we learn from what you tell us. George. Thank you, Mr. Barulius. You know, um, I've learned how to pray, and the reason I've learned how to pray is I never know what George is going to say when he gets up here. So I sit back there every time he, he makes an introduction, and I pray a lot. Um, great. Just to embellish a little bit on what George had to say, we've been doing this stewardship thing for quite a while. I think it was close to 12 years. And we, start, we started out by making presentations and getting people enthused and getting them excited about stewardship, but when we left, they didn't know what to do. Normally we had groups of people together, and uh, we'd have two or three from each parish. When they went back to their parish councils, they didn't know how to explain what we were talking about or how to get it done. So we've started a new program, and that program is to visit the parishes on two individual separate weekends. The first weekend we, we go to be with the parish, we meet with the leadership on Friday night, we have dinner with the parish council, so that we can get to understand exactly this parish's particular point of development. When we understand that, we can deal with their issues trying to, better than trying to do a, a shutdown effect and scatter it everywhere. The next morning, we meet with the stewardship committee. Again, we're looking at their particular issues, their particular problems, and we talk about stewardship and what it means, and you'll hear some of that today. In the afternoon, we deal with the ministry leaders of the parish. Normally we find that most of the, most of the leadership in the ministry area of a parish sits with a lot of parish council members. And we find parish councils that are not, that are not ministry-based organizations. And by ministry-based organizations, I'm talking about not every member of the parish council has a set area of responsibility. Not only does he not have a set area of responsibility, but there's no accountability. And so what usually happens when you have a parish like that, you get the old 80-20 rule. Alfredo Pareto was an Italian economist who in 1896 came up with a theory that in any financial tr transaction, 80% of the uh, uh, effects were generated by 20% of the causes. 
since that time we've extrapolated that and we say 20% of the people give 80% of the money and 20% of the people do 80% of the work and when you've got a situation like that it's not a good situation to be in because usually what happens is we keep working the 20% we get burnout and then we've got problems on top of that in the on the um, on the Saturday afternoon we talk about the importance of ministry and how to set up and run a ministry based organization um, we know that people who get involved in church work have an opportunity to grow spiritually when that happens, they see the need, and the money is a byproduct. So the more ministry you have, the less financial problems you have. The more ministry you have, the less facerias you have, or problems. So the whole program, as far as we're concerned, is not to go and ask somebody to fill out a stewardship card, because when you do that, they think what George just said earlier, that we want to get in their pocket. But if we ask them to get involved in the ministry, now we're demonstrating that we want them. So stewardship is not about money. Stewardship about, is about the mission of the church. It's about saving souls, yours and mine. So the more we concentrate on involvement, the more we go after people to get involved in the work, in God's work in the church, then we start to create an atmosphere and a situation where stewardship can foster where it can grow. So it, it's all about involvement and you're gonna hear some, some of that this morning. I'm gonna go through this presentation quickly because we'd like to be more interactive and we just don't wanna talk at you, we wanna talk with you. So very quickly, this uh, stewardship presentation we presented at the Clergy Lady Congress. I'm gonna go over it again. There's an area concerning consensus and we have a special exercise with regard to consensus and in the evening program that we're going to do this evening we're going to teach consensus we're going to take people through an exercise we're going to teach consensus we're going to teach working together getting that synergy moving and that's what we're going to do this evening so to go forward our mission for the stewardship national ministry is the mission of the national stewardship ministries is to teach promote and establish the practice of true Christian stewardship in all parishes and the Greek Orthodox Church of America, uh, Archdiocese of America. Now what do I mean by true Christian stewardship? That's a definition that we've come up with that means that we don't need fundraisers to run the operations of the church, that we get it all through the donation of true Christian stewardship. And in my parish, which I always use as an example, for well, the last 15 years, we have not used any money from fundraisers, from festivals, or anything of that nature to run our parish. Now, the vision for the National Stewardship Ministries is to have all Greek Orthodox faithful and parishes, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America, fully on true Christian stewardship. And our goal is that by 2020, all parishes within the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America can fully meet their mission, support and, extens and e e expand an extensive array of ministries through the practice of true Christian stewardship and eliminate the dependence on non-steward support. That's a pretty big goal, but that's what we've set our, our vision at. We're going to talk about culture, organization and structure. Every parish has a culture, and you can tell that for the, after the first three minutes that you walked into the narthex on any parish in the country. How do you tell that? By the way you're treated. Are they warm and friendly as you walk in the door? Do they take care of you? Or do they look at you cross-eyed and look at you like, who's that stranger and what's he doing in my parish? And there's many examples of that. One beautiful example that we had was in, in South Florida where they greeted us in the parking lot, not even in the narthex. They were outside in the parking lot. They, they said, you're not here, you're not from here. They said, no. They said, welcome. They greeted us. They took our information down in, a, in, in a, a guest book so that the priest could welcome us after the service was over. They even put a little cross on the lapel of our coat 
so that other people in the parish would knew that we were visitors. So it was wonderful. It was like being home. It was like being with family. And that's really what it's all about. If you don't have a good welcoming program, if you don't have a welcoming committee to do that kind of work, uh, you're not going to have that culture that you need to have. That culture that I'm talking about emanates from one place. It emanates from the leadership and from the priest. That combination, that leadership, that parish council is what emanates. If you've got a warm, loving, connected, united parish council, you're going to have the same thing through the parish. If you've got a divided parish council, if you've got problems amongst them, that schism shows all the way through your parish. We are a monkey see, monkey do society. So if we want to have a culture that is warm and friendly and gives us that joy and that peace, that love of God and love of one another, it has to start at the top. Organization I'm going to cover and I'm going to cover structure. So I've talked about love of God and love of one another. I was fortunate. Um, has anybody seen any of our presentations before? Okay. I was fortunate enough to go to Australia where I'm from and uh, I went down there for last Christmas. While I was down there, I happened to attend their clergy lady conference. And uh, one of the classes that they had down there, workshops, was love of God and love of one another. And the priest who was conducting the workshop had a story, and I'd like to repeat it here. He said there was a husband and wife who'd been married for some time, and they decided to watch the sunset off their front porch. She was drinking a glass of wine, and they sat on the porch, and they were enjoying the sunset. And after a while, the husband heard the wife say, I love you. You're the best thing that's ever happened in my life. If you were not here, I wouldn't want to be here either. So after a pause, the husband said, was that you talking, or was it the wine? And she looked at him, and she said, no, it was me talking, but I was talking to the wine. <laughs> so, we know that if you have love of God and love of one another in your parish, you don't have to worry about stewardship. It's going to take care of itself. It really does. I've got a quote, an example that I give for this, which is the, the cathedral in Atlanta. They built a huge complex, beautiful complex. They went over budget by about $5 million dollars. And a lot of people were mad. And it created a schism in the parish. And we had clicks and why did they do that? And how could they possibly do that? And that's not what we agreed on. And you name it. And so they suffered. That extra $5 million was a debt on the parish. And they weren't able to get rid of it. And uh, so for a period, I'd say at least five or six years, that parish struggled. They struggled with the debt. It caused a problem within the whole organization. A new priest came on board. He taught them these two things, love of God and love of one another. Today that, he's been there two and a half years and that debt is gone. So he united the people, he put them together, he taught them that love of God and love of one another. And like I said, if you have those things, if that permeates within your parish, don't worry about it, stewardship's gonna take care of itself. So what do you expect to be true of a parish that is fully meeting its mission? Let's go through that. Excellent attendance and participation in the sacraments. That means we've got a lot of people that are participating in, this, in the sacraments. We're sanctifying them. Active and enthusiastic participation. Well, I'm fluffy already. In activities and functions. That's the drugs working, guys. <laughs> Generous donations. Enthusiastically volunteering time and talent. And the parish emulates the kingdom of God. A culture overflowing with joy, peace, and love. You get that little taste of heaven in this parish because of the love and the atmosphere that's created by that love and respect of one another. We're all created in the image and likeness of God. If we carry that divine stamp, then we've got to treat one another as if we were dealing with Christ himself. I have been in parish council meetings that are supposed to start at 7 o'clock and finish at 9 and we've been there at 11.30, and I've got two people each side of the counter when I was parish council president, and they're screaming at one another over a $200 item. Meanwhile, in the two hours or three hours beforehand, we've spent $50,000 either on an air conditioner or on the parking lot. 
And that does not create unity. So how do we get to get towards the kingdom of God? We need to develop parish leadership that's oriented in the Holy Trinity. We need to foster that culture that I've spoken about. And we need to promote spiritual development through the practice of true Christian stewardship. All right? So let's review. If we've got a parish like the one on the left, and it's disorganized, we're not going to get any. I want you to think about a sailing ship. And everybody on board the ship has a duty to perform, especially the guy that's handling the sails. All right? So the guy on the sail suddenly decides he's not going to follow normal practice, and he's going to go on his own agenda, just like sometimes on parish councils, we have people who have their own agenda, and they're trucking somewhere else. Is the ship going to sail? Is it going to move right? No, it's not. We need Everybody needs to be together. We need to be in synergy. Then we get a church that looks something like the one on the right-hand side. All right. The Greek festival was our greatest invention to save our churches. It was introduced in the late 1970s and the early 80s. Right? Today, 93% of our parishes are dependent on the festival to meet operational expenses which is nuts. All right? Let's look at our history. Let's look at where we've been. The early history of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese started with immigration in the early 1900s. All right? Our, our fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers came to this country not to stay. They heard that the, the streets here were paved with gold, and they were going to come here for a few years, they're going to make a lot of money, and then we're going to go back to Greece. How many of them went back? One to three percent. The others stayed here, and they still wanted that connection to the old country, so what did we do? The Archdiocese did, did, wasn't formed. We didn't suddenly decide, the Greek Orthodox Church uh, in Greece didn't decide to come and evangelize this country. So they went and they, got, they wanted that church connection, so we went and hired the priests. Some of them were village priests, some of them were not theologians. But eventually the parishes were formed, and full-time priests came here, and, and we started the church. Then, the Archdiocese was formed in the early 1920s, and from the 1920s to the 40s, the early parish councils were introduced. So, from the 1950s until now, here's how we've operated. We've got an, an educated theologian priest, we've got elected parish councils, we've got a general assembly, and then we've got the parishioners. So, from the 1950s until now, this is how we've operated. So tell me, how many non-religious organizations do you know that are still successful today after using the same method for over 60 years? Doesn't happen. So we recommend something different. We're talking about a ministry-based organization, but we'll get to that. So, how it was and how it is. The education of our grandparents and uh, great-grandparents was limited, it was informal. Today, we're the highest educated in the United States. Our income back in those days, immigrants, blue collar workers, merchants, today it's the third highest pay in the United States. We used to be number two, but we've been taken over by the Indians. The average trade contribution back then was a dollar. Today, it's still a dollar. The percentage of the budget paid by fundraisers in our parishes today, back then it was zero. Today it averages 32%. So we're, we're, we're doing fundraisers all over the place so that, we can, so that we can run our churches. Look at this statistic below. In a $1920, today is $12.33. A $1965, today is $7.47. So here's the bottom line. Our membership is down. Our sacraments are down. Our contributions are lower. Member spirituality is declining. Stewardship is down. Disengagement by the youth is increasing. We lose them as soon as they, they go to college. The number of deaths are increasing. And more parishes are dependent on festivals. We've got a lot of work to do. So what is a ministry-based organization? Like I said before, a ministry-based organization is one where every member of the parish council has a designated set responsibility and 
we had ministry and ministry leaders. Right? In ministry-based organizations, all ministries, programs, and activities of the parish are delivered by the individual ministries, managed and coordinated by a partnership of the priest, a council of ministries, and the parish council. So let's look at what is a council of ministries. A committee of, committee of leaders of each of the parish's ministries. The council of ministries includes the priest and the parish council liaisons. The council of ministries helps ensure that each parish is aligned with the parish's mission, vision, values, and strategies. We're gonna talk a lot about that. The council of ministries meets at least quarterly, I prefer every two months, and shares ideas, strategies, programs, best practices, challenges, and finds areas where the ministries can work together. Take a look at this diagram. If you look at this, you'll see that in the center of this organizational structure is the priest and the parish council. That's your leadership. The parish council should be leaders in the planning, development, motivation, encouragement, and the teaching of all the ministries. They should not run the ministries themselves. All right? You'll see in the next circle around the parish, the priest and the parish council, is the term liaison. So as well as doing the things that I just mentioned, the parish council should be assigned as liaisons to a particular ministry. Outside of the liaison circle, you're gonna see ministry. So here we have ministry, various ministries. We have in the center of it the parish council. We have parish council members being liaisons and support mechanisms to the ministries. And we have ministry, not run by the parish council, but run by individual parishioners from within the parish. Then outside of that, we have a council of ministries, where that council of ministries all gets together and they discuss where they are and how they're doing, and then we know what everybody else within the parish is doing. And then outside of that, we have governance, we have the general assembly. So let's look at that for a minute. If we're gonna have ministry run by ministry leaders that are parishioners, what a great farming mechanism that is. Our future parish council members come from the ministry leaders. And it's, 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 an, it's, it's a natural evolution. Think about it. If he's a ministry leader, he's, everybody in the parish is going to know him. They're going to know him because of the work he does within that particular ministry. So, when we start the year and we have that first parish council member and we've sworn in the parish council, what's the first thing we should do? The first thing we do is appoint the ministry liaisons. And we ask every parish council member to tell us what ministry they would like to liaise to and the reasons why. So if you've got somebody who just came from another parish and he's volunteering and he's been involved with the youth and he's got experience in that area, that's a natural fit. So what we do is we ask every member of the council to fill out what they would like to do. And then the priest and the parish council president determine the liaison role for every parish council member. Then we establish what our ministries are. And as these parish council members are assigned to those ministries, they teach, they train, they motivate, they recognize, and they create a budget. So, now we have a situation where a parish council member is working with a ministry leader, they're working together, they've determined what their goals and objectives are gonna be for the year, they've determined how much money they're gonna to need to do that, and now they're making out a recommendation to the council to approve them for the budget. Now what has happened just now? What's happened is, now we've got ministry driving the budget instead of the budget being driven, uh, we've got, sorry, we've got ministry driving the budget instead of the budget driving the ministry. And what's happening across the country right now, that's what we're doing. We see it, we look at the budget, how much we did last year, blah, blah, blah. Then we get to the bottom line and whatever's left, that goes to ministry. That's not a ministry-based organization. That's not how we're going to grow the church. Remember, the more ministry we have, the less money problems we have, the more ministry we have, the, the, <clears throat> the less facilities we have. So, how are we going to do all this? Right? George said something when he spoke earlier about strategic planning. We don't go down to the airport and say, give me a ticket to somewhere. 
the, the captain that's charting his flight from Atlanta to San Francisco knows exactly what he needs to do to, his, get, to, to get to his destination. He knows to take into account wind shears. He knows what uh, altitude he's going to fly at. He knows he's going to make adjustments. But eventually, his target is San Francisco, and he's got to go. Why don't we do that with our parishes? Do you know where your parish is going to be a year from now? Do you know where it's going to be five years from now? Because if we don't, then what we're doing is we're being reactive. We're not being proactive. We're not in control. Somebody else is control in control and we're reacting to it. So, to do a strategic planning, which is what George and I do, we do that on the second visit or the second weekend. I told you on the first weekend, we go in and we work with the parish council, we work in the morning with stewardship, we work in the afternoon with the ministry leaders and we talk about all of this stuff. And then we give them some homework and eight or nine weeks after that we come back and we take them through a strategic plan. Well, what do we do in the strategic plan? The first thing that we do is develop a mission and a vision statement. Now, the mission of every parish is the same. Right? God came to earth so that we would be saved. So it stands to reason that salvation is the mission of every parish. If you look in the UPR, you're going to find that there's a long explanation of our mission. It's already there. So every parish's mission is the same. Now the vision, we're going to determine how we're going to fulfill that mission with our vision and how we're going to get there. So over a two-day period, we don't go through all that. We go through the issues in the parish, we go through ministry, we create strategic direction, we create a mission and a vision statement, and now the priests in the parish council have not only got a ministry-based organization, it's already set up and established, but now with the mission and the vision statement, they've got a roadmap on how they're going to get there. Please stop me at any time if you have any questions. So the hierarchy remains the same. We've still got governance in the General Assembly and the Parish Council. We've got ministry being run and we've got our parishioners. So strategic planning process. Here's a, 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 a list of ground rules that can be used for meetings and for strategic planning and so forth. You start on time and you end on time. Not like the example I gave you. You respect the chair and its facilitators. Your, all decisions are made by consensus, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Everybody participates. No idea or question is dumb. Side issues are parked. Sometimes we're on a subject and somebody goes off on a tangent and before you know it, we're distracted from what we're trying to do, so you put the side issues aside. There's no side discussions. You cannot run a meeting and have two guys yakking on this side of the room and two on this side of the room and expect to get anything done. And if we treat one another with the love and respect I spoke about earlier, we will create an atmosphere that will allow the Holy Spirit to participate. And when that happens, we can do incredible things. So, if you continue doing what you've been doing, you'll continue to get what you've been getting. Is that what you want? The definition of insanity is what? It's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So, a strategic direction is typically expressed as a term or a phase. It indicates an area needing our concentrated efforts, right? A strategic direction, an area of work that needs to be addressed if the parish is going to make progress and get towards its mission and its vision, and a strategic direction is an area needing attention Do it's not because it's not meeting its goals. The planning is guiding the members of an organization to envision its future and to develop the procedures to get us towards that future. And a strategic planning for a parish is the process by which a parish leaders envision the parish's future and then we develop the procedures to get there. The objective is a statement which can, will be specifically achieved and a strategy is a short-term description of what needs to be done to get to the strategic objective. Consensus. Does anybody understand what I mean when I talk about consensus? Again, I'll go back to my parish. We haven't taken a vote in 15 years. Consensus creates unity. And let me give you an example. 
let's assume we've got a parish council of 15 people, okay? And we've got a real emotional issue to deal with. Let's say we wanna, we wanna sell the church and we're gonna go buy land further out of town and build a new church. And we've worked on it for some time and we take a vote and the vote, I'll give you the extreme example, the vote comes down 15 to seven. What are we, I mean, eight to seven. What have we got? We've got to split, we've got to do it. Do you think the seven, we've got eight winners and seven losers. Do you think the seven losers are gonna keep quiet about it? Or are they gonna go home and talk to their spouse or their bubaro? And we've, pretty soon we've taken that split at the parish council and stuck it right in the middle of the parish. Now consensus is not easy and it's time consuming, but it creates unity. If we all come out together saying, I can support that, I can live with that, I can support it, it's not my first choice, but I still can support it, then you've done something great for the parish. Our Archbishop, in our Executive Council meetings, has talked to us about concession. I mean consensus. Um, so, it's my words again. Um, but consensus is, is really important. It, it does some wonderful things to the parish. Um, some of the key questions that we ask is anybody got any objections to this decision? Can you live with it and support it? And so, <clears throat> here, here they are. Does everyone accept the decision? Is there any opposition to the decision? Can everyone live with this decision? Can everyone support the decision? The benefits when decisions are formed through consensus to the parish, increased productivity, increased quality, reduced cost in time and resources, and an increased morale, an enhanced parish culture, and an enhanced sense of community. Question. Yes. Is consensus unanimity? No. What is it then? Consensus is, and sometimes consensus won't work. Consensus is saying that it's not my first choice, but I think about it, I can live with it. 